Uh, hello, uh, my name is Warwick Smith. I'm here today to talk to you about the clinical implementation of 3D printed um, brachytherapy HDR applicators. Um, I've bring, brought with me a couple of models here. Um, I'd love to share around the room. Many of you have already seen these before, um, but it's always a lot of fun to play with some tools. There you go. That one's heavy, by the way, so watch your toes. And there you go. All right, so these are some, just some models that I'll be sort of talking about today. Um, I want to start by saying that this uh, research was generously funded by um, the Osborne Park Healthcare Group, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, and the Charlie's Foundation of Research. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge them and their contributions. And also, I'd like to acknowledge each one of my supervisors, of which the list seems to just continuously grow. <laughs> um, each, each one of these people have contribute, contributed significantly to this research, and uh, I wouldn't be presenting today if it wasn't for them. So thank you. Um, why does somebody, or why do, why would somebody get brachytherapy? Um, brachytherapy is, or can be a very invasive um, radiotherapy um, method, but some of the advantages are a high dose of radiation in a more targeted area over a very short period of time. So a fractionation course for brachytherapy would be about five fractions um, at, at a high or elevated dose rate. Um, there's two types of brachytherapy. We have interstitial, which is through um, the tissue, and contact brachytherapy, which is the type of brachytherapy that I'll be uh, investigating further um, in, in the research, which is the research. So we are delivering about 12 grays per hour, um, and it, it is a non-invasive, superficial type of treatment. It can be used for metastatic melanomas, um, basal cell carcinomas, um, and, and various other regions, um, various other cancers. Um, it involves using a single source applicator, which one of you might have. Um, this source will travel down the length of a tube, which what we can see here, um, traveling down the length of the tube, and the vicinity to the tumor area is uh, very, very close um, on, on, you know, when, when you look at it. Um, so the actual source itself um, looks like this, the source that's being around the room right now. Um, on the tip of it will be the Iridium-192. It's obviously a, a dead source. <laughs> it's not active. Um, and it's attached, uh, welded by a steel cable um, to, to the end of it. And the, the, um, the tube, oh, sorry, the, the metal um, source itself is fed through these applicator tubes here. Um, and so the machine here drives the, um, the source through um, the applicator or the catheter pathway, and it's all remotely controlled. And this machine is called a remote afterloader, um, currently used in Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. Um, so what we are able to do is set the source dwell positions with respect to um, how far the source will travel down the length of the applicator tube. And the sort of physics responsible for that is um, the inverse square law. Um, so basically what that says is as we are sort of closer to uh, the radioactive source, the more um, dose or relative dose we would receive. So the further away we are, the less dose. And this is a sort of um, exponential kind of function as, as we go away. Um, yeah. Uh, so all of this works off the Paris system um, for brachytherapy. The Paris system is the gold standard for bra um, contact brachytherapy. Um, so we have sources must be positioned in a linear pathway um, along the same plane of field. Um, they must be uniformly spaced with the um, same travel distance, the same dwell positions. Um, and the applicator uh, to the tissue must be uh, uniformly placed as well. Following these rules, we should get ge geometry, um, ge geometrically uh, accurate tumor coverage. Um, and when factored in with TG43, which is a dose to water calculation, um, we're able to look at how the radiation would permeate through the, the water um, medium. Um, so this whole process starts with a diagnostic CT scan with a breast biopsy or a biopsy of the tissue, the cancer tissue, um, 
confirming that the patient has cancer. This is then uh, pushed forward to the radiation oncology where the patient will receive a planning CT scan. It's a higher resolution CT, usually more uh, dose is involved with that. Um, the patient also receives a 3D optical scan um, of their face and the mask is created. It's milled from um, this optical 3D scan really. Um, after this, a bolus type of material called aquaplast, which is a water um, equivalent material, is applied to the um, surface of the milled face. And with the help of glue um, and, and wax, you're able to sort of position the applicators accordingly. Um, now, th this is the current method. After all of that is done, you can CT it um, on the patient for positioning purposes and you can continue with creating your um, CTV margin and uh, your relative um, dosimetry involved there. So, um, yeah, you, you, you know, the, basically align it with the CT, make sure that the device fits the patient. The problem with this method is it can take up to four to five days, sometimes even a week to create this device. Um, it's not dimensionally accurate due to human errors involved. Um, the model that you just saw on the previous slide had air cavities um, present all through it. Radiation travels further in air than it does in uh, water. Um, this will result in um, unavoidable hot spots and um, during the actual process itself, you're losing some of that resolution when you're creating your milled um, product. Um, so the aims of my research was to improve the um, precision, the um, geometrical accuracy of the um, applicator placement. Um, I also wanted to reduce the relative um, dose um, <coughs> that the current methods have by about 20% um, and potentially reduce the treatment planning time from, you know, from four or five days down to maybe one to three days, which I thought was quite reasonable. Um, and to do a dosimetric comparison against uh, some different treatment types. See, brachytherapy is a very specialized method and might not necessarily be um, readily available for smaller clinics, um, countryside. So they will likely um, not proceed with this treatment type and use another form of treatment like VMAT or um, electron-based methods. So it's important to um, look at these methods in comparison for brachy. Um, so it all starts with a CT scan. The CT scan gives us the Houdensfield units, which are the um, sort of um, intensity of the CT. It, it tells us what the different um, material is in, in the patient for bone to air to, to fatty tissue, really. Um, so there is a relationship that exists between the electron density and the Houndsfield units. And this is um, detailed in a graph here. This, this graph here is actually experimentally determined. It's part of the QA process for a CT scan. And it's how we are able to um, differentiate between the different types of tissues inside a patient. It's how we get our information. Um, so it's based off this, this data here. Um, this one is very important. So the electron density of a material, pro it determines how ionizing radiation will penetrate through this material. So it's very important to um, understand that process really. So for something like aquaplast, which has an electron density close to water, um, just for all intents and purposes, we will say it's water. Um, when we have a CT scan of the 3D printed bolus, we have an electron density of 1.11, right? So it's different, it's not water. Now to correct for that, we can look at it in terms of um, dose to water, right? Dose to water calculation. And um, we can look at how the density, um, you know, the, the sort of difference between the two in order to correct for it. Meaning that rather than having 1.11 centimeter of material, we can reduce that to 0.9 um, centimeters. And we should get roughly the same type of um, radiation permeation through this material that would respond to water. So that's more or less how it works. <laughs> but how, how do we know? How do we know? Why though? How, how does it work? Um, 
we can prove this using um, film dosimetry. Um, so film dosimetry with an average source, this will all change, of course, as the source decays over time, um, or the energy wouldn't, but the activity would. Um, yeah, uh, so, oh, right. So people in the past have tried to measure this with film, and they've created a um, device similar setup to this, where film is sort of positioned in the middle, and they have a um, HDR applicator traveling over the top, and using the treatment planning system, you, you expect to have a certain dose output. Um, people have also tried to dose to air and done a um, factor uh, calibration um, in there, but both of these did yield um, not really too accurate results. But I decided to try the first approach, the, the one on the left earlier, um, and I created the device, similar setup to the other, um, uh, other author, and this is the dose output that we expected. Um, we position the film over one of these planes, we zoom in, and we can sort of see, you know, it, it does appear quite uniform in this region, but potentially not really entirely uniform in other slices of that CT. So what I did find was non-uniformity on my dose um, in, in the area that I expected it. So it made me question the treatment planning system. <laughs> um, I then looked at creating a device called, uh, I, I call it the independent brachytherapy device, and this consists of a um, water equivalent material with two inserts, one inner and one outer. The inner insert has a very small 0.2 millimeter groove, which is um, ready for film to be positioned in there. We have our uh, single source brachytherapy traveling through the center of the middle insert, and reference ion chambers if we wanted to do um, independent um, point, or point dose uh, averaging. Um, and the result that we have here is very uniform isodose lines um, for, our, um, for our film, which would be sort of positioned directly in here. Um, so this gives us an independent point dosimetry and can also be used to verify our treatment planning software. But it's not really what it was. Um, used for the project, um, more or less, that was used to create this lovely curve here, which is my um, film calibration curve for the red channel. Um, so we have a 0.9963 um, R squared value indicating a very strong correlation, which is excellent. Much better than what I got before. <laughs> um, the next part was to create our phantom, our patient. Film is easily able to scratch, and if I used the milled product on the left, um, it would likely damage the film and render my results unreadable. So I needed to create a material, silicon-based material, which resembles the elasticity of human skin. I'm not <coughs> measuring dose to the tumor, I'm measuring dose to the surface where the tumor, just above where the tumor is. So I should be able to get an accurate readout of that. So how do I go about creating that? We start with our patient. Our patient gets his 3D optical scan. And, oh, what happened there? Oh, all right. Um, we upload the patient into our 3D software. We select the region that we want to uh, take a snippet of. And this region will be much larger than the area um, our region of interest, this is where the tumor site is, uh, much larger than that, and we can extract that information off, essentially creating a face separate from the patient's face. This face is then uh, duplicated and um, increased by a thickness of 6.375 millimeters um, for one of those duplicate models. The other duplicate model is increased by 19.375 millimeters. Um, which would act as the bolus for the material. And so what you effectively get is an applicator um, source distance and the bolus, the region, outside of that. So when we put these two together, you should see that the applicators will sit exactly in the middle uh, along the same plane. That's the first part of the Paris system for brachytherapy. So it works more or less like this. We have our tissue, we have our applicator, we have our diameter with our radius. This needs to be positioned, uh, for all intents and purposes, five millimeters away from the tissue. 
um, or 6.35, sorry, 6.375 millimeters if you factor in the middle of the source, the expected middle of the source with a distance between applicator to applicator being um, really 12.75 millimeters, factoring in the middle of the source as well, and with the bolus sitting um, the length of, of you know, the, the rest, really, about two centimeters. And this pattern is repeated across the entire surface. No matter how that surface changes in, in slope and design, um, it's normal to that plane, to the patient plane. So very important. Um, the model is then created exactly as I just explained. Um, we can watch the animation, or I can quickly skip through it. I think I'll quickly skip through it. <laughs> um, more or less what we have is the three-dimensional um, placement of uh, the applicators on the surface of our, um, I guess, applicator bolus is what we will call it. Um, it's converted into a 2D plane and um, a curve is fitted to the surface, indicating um, that it will be positioned that um, distance away from uh, the patient's skin. Um, and then this is converted into um, tubes or channels which would replicate exactly the pathway in which our applicators will go down. Um, yeah. And eventually, using a Boolean intersection function, we can then um, take out the middle part of the um, second duplicated model, the um, two centimeter thick bolus. And what we are left with in the middle is channels which are able to perfectly um, insert one of our brachytherapy applicators directly in um, and, and yeah, for, for positioning reasons. The next part is we need to test um, how we're going to measure our uh, our, our, our data, and um, we do this by film dosimetry, um, taking a average pixel area. Um, so this is just some of the films that we used in the, in the research. It's uh, nothing too special. <laughs> um, and then these are the different types of plans that were created for the different um, treatment methods. We've got 9MEV, uh, 6MV VMAP plan. We can see the radiation in the VMAP plan travels much further than it does the electron. And for the applicator, uh, again, we, we can sort of see that it is penetrating as well. And it's interesting to note because it looks like the applicators would you know, perform more or less equivalently to the VMAP one in this case. So interesting. But what do the results say? This is what the results say. We look at film measured against the plan, um, the expected uh, prescription that the surface region of the tumor would receive, and what we have is um, under under you know about twenty percent under what we should be getting, and this is consistent for VMAT electron and the clinical bolus. But for the three D printed bolus, we're getting almost exactly the amount that we intended to deliver to the tumor, or to the surface of the tumor, I should say. Um, so the film is. Um, two, two eyes on the, uh, sorry, the two eyes had pieces of film on them and the nose, which is the tumor region, um, it, that, that's, your, that's your surface area that you're um, taking it from. Um, I forgot to delete that one. <laughs> so this is the um, dose to the eyes, the expected dose to the eyes versus the measured dose to the eyes for each of the different treatment plans. The red dashed line indicates the area where um, a threshold of five gray, um, anything above that would lead to um, cataract formation. Um, anything above a 10 gray threshold leads to visual impairment. Um, so we can see that for the VMAP plan, we will have cataracts, we will have potential visual impairment as well. Um, same is also found for the brachytherapy. Uh, electrons performed remarkably better, um, simply because there was a shield in the form of an electron cutout, which was positioned to not um, have, have radiation dose build up to the eyes. So when we compare the treatment plan versus the measured dose, we can see that for the three clinical methods, we're under dosing by about 20% on average, but for the 3D printed method, it's about 0.7% which is interesting. <laughs> um, when we look at the radiation grays of um, the, the exact same thing, 
uh, with error bars, we can also see, again, we are underdosing by approximately 10 gray across the entire treatment course. So 16 fractions for all treatments, and we are under-delivering. So, yeah. What is the immediate clinical <laughs> implication of this? We should be using eye shields for brachytherapy and also VMAT deliveries if you're a small clinic. Um, electrons, I know we do use eye shields for, um, and we should still continue doing that, absolutely. But this should tell us that we should be using it for brachytherapy as well. So some of the um, outcomes of this means, well, for the first time ever, we've been able to accurately recreate the parasystem for brachytherapy for very complex sites such as the nose, um, which has been very difficult to accomplish up to this point. Um, this method is um, ready to be um, implemented into the clinic um, with uh, accurate and precise um, yeah, pa patient treatments in, in, in focus, really. Um, I've managed to do this all with uh, uh, under 24 hours, which is really good. <laughs> Um, and it's also a very inexpensive approach. It's about the uh, amount of money that you would spend on a cup of coffee to create. So it's um, financially viable as well. You have a reduction in geometric dosimetric um, errors. Um, and yeah. So for the future work, I think um, research into the uh, 3D, or well, sorry, the integration of an eye shield into the 3D model itself, where we could limit the radiation traveling anywhere close to the eyes um, for this type of treatment. Um, we could create solid blocks where the applicators would push up into and would no longer um, go further traveling across the eyes or the lenses in this, in this case. Um, so that, that, that's for shielding purposes. Um, and this could all be determined using uh, the TG43 um, dose calculation. We can look at the point, um, sort of dosimetry of where the radiation would permeate through into. Um, another another uh, thing that we could also do, so future work, is direct um, importation from the 3D file into the treatment planning software. And what that means, what we could do is virtually create a treatment plan because our treatment planning software doesn't know the difference between plastic to, to, to cardboard. It, it, it is all based on water. It, it assumes that your, your dwell positions are all in water and it's only looking at time for all intents and purposes. It doesn't look at angles or anything like that. So if we could virtually create the models, we could import that into the treatment planning system and this would allow us to virtually create a model before it's printed, optimizing the treatment for the patient, followed by the 3D printing of that model, which could then be CT scanned and then image register, uh, re registered to the CT, original CT of the patient for um, patient positioning. So you're actually um, removing a step where the patient does not necessarily need an extra CT for image registration. Um, so the aims of the project were to in, you know, ha have an accuracy of 0.5 millimeters um, with respect to the patient uh, position. And I did, in fact, do that and following the gold standard, the Paris system. So excellent. Um, geometric and dosimetric errors have been reduced by 20% for my model. Again, that's a good outcome. And um, I've reduced the treatment planning to less than 24 hours for this model, which is a pretty good outcome as well. Makes it almost comparable to um, the current clinical methods like VMAP. Yeah. Um, were there any questions? Yes. <laughs>